PhD was done, I think, if I remember combustion theory or something similar. Yeah, it's yeah. true. In, uh, with uh, uh, Beberness, uh, it was uh, Colorado State. Boulder. Boulder, Colorado. It was Boulder, Colorado. And, uh, and then uh, he came back to Italy. Then uh, I think it was back and forth uh, for a while. Uh, uh, I don't talk about the Italian system of concorsi, but <laughs> for young people, I tell you that uh, it's always the same story. And uh, so the Alberto then got uh, interested uh, in uh, multivalued equations, and uh, he had very important results in this uh, in these fields. And then uh, he entered the conservation law with this, his previous experience also, I think uh, your multivalent equation was related to control theory. So he had uh, ideas from uh, geometric control theory that he brought uh, into the field of conservation law, which had uh, a tremendous impact. Uh, it was um, going um, about the middle of the 90s. And uh, I can tell you that I was a witness of that because uh, Alberto came uh, to Stony Brook and there was a conference uh, in, uh, the usual big conference in conservation law, I was uh, one invited the speaker. He, was, he came just to do a presentation. At the, at the end, his room was filled up more than a plenary talk. All parallel communication were devastated because he came with the results that had essentially already done most of the theory of a semi-group and uh, many of the ideas uh, that uh, you can find uh, now in this wonderful mo monograph of conservation law. Uh, later on, Alberto had a lot of students. He, he came back to, in Italy definitively to Sissa. In Sissa, he settled, uh, uh, he had uh, very many students. Uh, one of them is here, is Deborah. I think, uh, I don't know if somebody else, no, I think the, the other are grandchildren. In this room, there are some grandchildren. And uh, so then uh, he, start, he, he did with uh, Stefano Bianchini the fundamental results that uh, concerned the vanishing viscosity, which was a limit for the system of conservation law. And this was uh, an expected result since many years. But, uh, you know, when a result is expected since many years, it's, not, it's difficult, it's not uh, easy. And uh, since very important mathematician tried to do that before him, this uh, paper uh, had very striking ideas inside. This one was really a, piece of a wonderful piece of mathematics. And, uh, and Alberto was then invited uh, as a plenary speaker in Beijing, I think, if I'm not wrong, yes. in, the, uh, in the International Mathematical Union Conference to present this result. Then uh, Alberto <laughs> went back to the US and uh, settled in Penn State, where he presently is. He, has, he continued to work in many, many fields. He has interest in differential games, among cooperative games, and equilibrium. Uh, you, you can see continue to do hyperbolic. He has done counterexample of uniqueness uh, for Euler equation. So th there are uh, a lot of mathematics. There is a lot of mathematics. He has done some fancy model of uh, plants growth. So there are, there are a lot of pieces of mathematics that uh, he has done. And today is going to talk about this optimal control of propagation fronts and the moving sets. Thank you, Alberto, for being here. And uh, please. All right. Thanks a lot for the kind introduction, for the invitation and the hospitality. Thanks to all of you for coming. So this talk will be on two very closely connected uh, topics. That is uh, optimal control of propagation fronts is one, and the other is uh, optimal control of moving sets. And well, as to start as motivation for this, I mean, I am mostly interested in the mathematical problems that arise from these models, but uh, just to see that they are not just come out of the blue, it, they have some practical motivation. So let's consider a parabolic equation mo modeling uh, the spread of a uh, population. Think of a population of pests like mosquitoes, right? So um, 
this is described by a reaction diffusion equation. So uh, here U is the population density and uh, alpha is a control effort. So you can think U as the density of mosquitoes, some invasive species, and alpha is the amount of pesticides that we use to wipe the, them out. Uh, and so the, this is described by classical uh, reaction diffusion equation. So F is the rate at which the population increases. And we think of this F as a function like this. So uh, it's zero at zero and it's zero at one. That means the maximum population sustained by the environment is normalized to one. Uh, and this is usually called the bistable uh, model because it has two stable equilibrium points, zero and one. And here, the simplest case is where G of alpha U is the amount of uh, pests that are killed by the control. The simplest thing is to take this is just the amount of pesticides times the density of the population, which is quite reasonable. Um, so what we want to do is instead of looking at an evolution problem for a parabolic equation, we want to simplify this and look at evolution equation for a set. And the idea is that uh, we have these two equilibrium state, that is U is equal zero, a free state, and U is equal one is the contaminated state. And since they are both stable equilibrium, we expect that the typical solution will consist of two regions where one where which is contaminated and one which is free, and then there will be some small interface between the two. So we could approximate it with a control problem for a moving set. So omega of t, roughly speaking, is the set of x such that the population is almost one, almost saturated. Okay. And what we want to do really is make this set as small as possible. Okay. Um, uh, okay. Um, so, sorry. I think I, yeah. Uh, so how do we control a moving set? Uh, so uh, a way to describe this control motion is simply to assign the inward normal speed at which the boundary of this set moves, right? So let's say that at any given uh, point X in the boundary, I specify this inward normal speed. And mm, to make the model realistic, I should uh, add some uh, cost for pushing it inward, right? If I don't do anything, very likely this contaminated set will keep expanding because these mosquitoes get, uh, infest more and more uh, territory. And so what I want to do is uh, push it inward. But of course, the faster I push it inward, the more the cost. So uh, a natural thing to assume here is that this E, the effort is some increasing function of the inner, uh, the speed, the inward speed, okay? So at any given time T, the total effort at this time would be the integral of the cost over all the, uh, the boundary of the set, okay? Now, in principle, I could come up with any uh, increasing function E of C, and that would give a reasonable uh, optimization problem for this set, right? However, I want this E to be connected with the original parabolic equation, okay? So how do I determine this function E depending on the inward uh, speed? Uh, this is determined by an auxiliary problem, which is, the optimal control of a traveling profile. So in this case, uh, what I look at is, again, my parabolic equation, but in this case, it would be one dimensional. And I look at a traveling front with a given speed C. And I want to find the cheapest control that achieves a traveling profile with that speed. That is, if I don't do anything like this, so let's say uh, alpha is zero, so G is zero here. 
Okay, so f will be some positive function. I think this is, will push up. And because of diffusion, this profile will move to the left with some speed C star. And it's well known, uh, you can find it in standard books like five. Uh, uh, there is one and only one uh, feed of traveling waves for this parabolic equation without this additional control term. And this typically will move to the left. So in this case, C star will be some negative uh, number. On the other hand, if I add this term, uh, G, of course, this is pushing it down. And if G is sufficiently big, this will push the whole traveling front to the, to the right instead of to the left. Okay. So the problem is given a, any speed C bigger or equal than C star, find a control function that has minimum effort. So in this case, minimum L1 naught. Okay. Uh, so more precisely, it would be uh, uh, formalized as this in this way. So I want to minimize the integral of alpha of X. So it's just the L1 norm because alpha will be positive among all functions such that there exists a solution of this ODE that describes the traveling wave with speed C and connects uh, these two uh, steady state at minus infinity and at plus infinity. Okay. So the standard way to approach this is, uh, well, you start proving that an optimal solution exists, then you can use some necessary condition or a Pontragi maximum principle, show that the uh, derive some necessary condition for the optimal control and then try to solve them. And hopefully you'll find a unique optimal control that achieves this uh, minimum. However, in this case, uh, we are in a happy situation where none of this is really needed because I can draw the optimal control right away uh, geometrically. And uh, this is how. So. Um, so we start with this uh, uh, ODE, and I can write this second order ODE as a system of first order ODE. Everybody knows that. Okay, so that's how it's written. And, uh, and now I'm looking for a traveling wave for this one. And if I write it as a system, that means that I want a, a profile, a curve, a solution of this that start at zero, zero, and ends up at one zero, okay? So u of zero is zero, and u prime of zero should be zero, and here the derivative should be zero, but uh, u should be one, okay? So if alpha is zero, of course, I don't find anyone, uh, any solution of this, because just think of alpha zero there, and you have an unstable manifold through the origin here, and the stable manifold through this uh, point one over here, and they are not the same. Okay, so that means that there is no uh, trajectory from here to here. On the other hand, of course, if I can add this term alpha times u, and alpha is essentially arbitrary, any positive function, and of course I can uh, add any, I can insert any trajectory like this, that starts here, ends up somewhere along this manifold. And if I take the concatenation, I have one traveling wave profile. Okay. Now the question is, which one has the minimum alpha or the alpha with minimum L1 norm? Okay, how do I find this? Um, the trick is to use, uh, to write this cost function as a line integral. And then I'll use Stokes theorem. So uh, this integral of alpha, since, well, du is p times dx, u prime is p. So I can write it in this form. And therefore I can write as an integral of this vector field here over a curve gamma. And gamma could be any curve starting here and ending there. Okay. So this is an equivalent way of writing my cost function, okay? Uh, and now we use a result that I learned in Boulder, Colorado from one of my 
teacher of uh, control theory, Henry Terms, who published that long time ago. In fact, this you can see the very first issue of Siam Journal of Control. Uh, the idea is this. So you consider this vector field V with components f of u over u p plus v over u and one over u. This is a vector field. And then your cost is the integral of this your vector field over any ad admissible path starting here and ending up here. Okay. At this point, the nice thing is that I can compare the cost among between the difference in the cost between any two curves starting here and and the and the up here because if I want to compare the cost of gamma one, let's say. Gamma one is this red one, and gamma two is anything else, right? What do I have to do? I have to integrate the curve of this in the region enclosed by these two curves, okay? And of course, this comes with a positive sign if it's uh, enclosed counterclockwise, and with the negative signs if the region is enclosed clockwise, okay? So when I want to compute the difference between these two costs, I integrate this uh, uh, over this part minus the integral of the curl over that part. And now I can immediately compute where this expression is positive, so in this shaded region, and where it's negative in this part here. Okay. And so at this point, it's clear that the optimal uh, trajectory would be to go to be as low as possible until you reach this point, then move just along the boundary of this, and then stay as high as possible from B to this point one. Because any other curve gamma two, uh, if you compute the integral, here you would have an integral uh, a neg of a negative quantity minus an integral of a positive quantity here, right? So the difference will always be negative. Okay, so immediately from this picture, you can see that this red one has to be the optimal one. Okay. Um, okay, uh, once we have this uh, expression, we can compute, well, th this defines the minimum cost of a control that achieves a traveling profile with this given speed C greater than C star. If it's C star, the zero control does it. Okay. You don't want to have anything less than C star because that comes with zero cost. And it turns out that the cost as a function of the speed of the traveling wave uh, pretty much grows linearly. So it's a function that has a certain asymptote. So E of C is a linear function of C plus some higher order terms. Okay. So this is uh, the first part of the talk, that is how do you uh, find uh, optimal control of traveling fronts. Now, what is the relation of this with the original problem of, uh, uh, so, uh, okay, <laughs> sorry, what I wanted to say here, um, this is an explicit solution in the scalar case. Um, here, I, uh, I have a few more slides I wanted to show you. Um, the idea is that you can play the same game, not just for a scalar reaction diffusion equation, but also for a system of equations. Okay. You can come up with any system of equation describing one or more populations. And then again, you can try to find the optimal control of traveling fronts for any given speed of these traveling fronts. Okay, so um, here, for example, this is another system of three equation that we consider with uh, Miyan Zag is one of my uh, most recent PhD students. She just got a PhD this uh, semester. So um, here, uh, for example, U again is the density of insects. Uh, I times U is the density of infected in insects. Theta would be the fraction of infected trees and alpha is the control as before. And um, 
as you can see in this model there is um, minus alpha of u these are the insects which are removed by pesticides and uh, and these uh, these are coupling terms it says that uh, the trees infect the insects and the insects infect the trees basically um, so what we want to say um, we want again to study traveling profiles uh, however in this case there are more than two steady states um, so one type of problem is this one so where you have at minus infinity, there are no insects, and every all the trees are healthy. And on the at plus infinity, there are uh, lots of insects, and they are all uh, unhealthy. <laughs> so, in this case, what you can prove um, is that for any c between c star and zero, you have an optimal control that achieves a traveling profile with speed c in this case you cannot have a speed bigger than zero because in this model the trees never recover so you cannot make them recover uh, so you cannot push the infection back uh, you cannot reverse it once it, it happened um, another thing we tried is uh, try to find optimal traveling wave but with different um, asymptotic states so the difference here is this one so at minus infinity we still have lots of insects the difference is that at minus infinity they are all healthy and at plus infinity they are all sick unhealthy all right so now again the question is can we find the control alpha which slows down the propagation speed if we do nothing, we have this propagation speed, which is t c star, which is exactly as before. Uh, so my original guess was that, okay, on this side, everything is healthy. On this side, they are all sick. Um, to slow down this infection, one thing we could do is remove the insects here in the middle, in the interface. So if we have a small amount of insects, this would produce like a, a buffer between the healthy zone and the contaminated zone. And this should slow down the contamination. And it turns out that it's not true. Not a, in fact, no matter how big this uh, control is, you can push it not to zero, but you could push it very close to zero for a long time. And yet uh, the, this does not, uh, produce a traveling wave with any slower speed so this is a kind of negative result in this case okay um okay so, so now we come to the second part uh what is the relation between these uh, results on optimal control of traveling fronts and moving sets so we want to compare two type of op optimization problems so one is optimization problem for the parabolic equation so what we want to minimize is the cost of the control so this is the, the amount of control so that's the effort plus the population size over time let's say plus the terminal population that's that's a natural thing to try to do and on the other hand the, the we have a optimization problem, but for a set, okay? So in this case, we want to uh, minimize a control cost. So P of the total effort. Now the effort is the effort for pushing the boundary of the set inward, plus the contaminated area over time, plus the final contaminated area. And as before, um, yeah, here I call beta, the normal speed from now on so for example this is the set of time t and let's say i concentrate my effort on this side so on this side i push it inward on this side i do very little so in this side the, the set may expand for example okay and uh, so this would be the total effort and this also gives uh, raise to an optimization problem but for a moving set 
So what is the relation between these two optimization problems? Um, some result in this direction is this one, a sharp interface limit. So you could uh, think of letting epsilon go to zero or equivalently, you look at this in infested, uh, this propagation uh, model from far away, let's say from a satellite, you look at uh, uh, a large region and you see where is contaminated, where is free. Uh, so the result would be this. So let's say I have a, an evolution for, of a set, which is uh, with C1 boundary. So I need some minimum regularity because I need to, uh, to define the inward speed. So if it's not C1, it uh, doesn't make much sense. Um, and let's say, so C1 boundary and beta is the normal speed. And I wanted, of course, to make be greater or equal than C star, which is a negative uh, quantity. Then given a motion for this uh, set, I can find a family of control function alpha epsilon and solution to the parabolic equation such that, well, first of all, the u epsilon, the solution of the parabolic equation rescaled, converges to the characteristic function of this set. Right. So the solution of the parabolic equation is equal to one or almost equal to one on omega t and almost equal to zero outside. Okay. And the effort, so the limit as epsilon goes to zero, the limit of alpha epsilon approaches the, the corresponding cost for controlling that, that set. So that would be um, the effort of moving with normal speed beta integrated over the boundary of omega t. And here I, I want to point out, there is still a major open problem here is to show that the optimization problem for a set valued uh, function is a gamma limit of these optimization problems for the parabolic equation uh, for epsilon as epsilon goes to zero. Of course, you all know that uh, gamma limits, proving a gamma limits involves two things. One is the easy one and one is the hard one, right? This is the easy one, okay? So this says that the cost for moving the set um, is um, greater or equal, I can, I can find a sequence of controls alpha epsilon, which achieves at least not more than the cost for moving the set. The hard part is showing that I cannot do any better than this by uh, choosing suitably this function alpha. Okay. Um, the fact that um, Chris, uh, can you repeat the question? Uh, where is the uh, the abstraction to do this uh, second part of the gamma limit? Uh, mainly because uh, this function e of beta is is uh, determined by a one-dimensional problem. Okay, so in principle, I could have a strategy along the boundary that oscillates a lot, for example, which is not uh, smooth, uh, which is maybe multi-dimensional, two-dimensional essentially, mm -hmm. which is not a traveling way. So we have some in simple result in that direction. Well, simple, not, not easy, but still, mm -hmm. but, uh, still quite far from a general, well, what is required here for uh, proving gamma convergence. Um, so the main motivation for coming up with this model is then coming up with uh, some uh, fun problems for moving sets. In fact, uh, as you said, I, uh, I started doing mathematics, uh, studying multi-valued uh, functions, uh, differential inclusion. So I, I like uh, set-valued functions. So this is uh, a new class of optimal control problem for moving sets. 
which I think is quite enjoyable, but there are still lots of things at, still at elementary level, which we don't understand. Okay, so the basic optimization problem for a moving set can be um, described like this. So you start with a given initial set, a subset in R2, and I want to find a motion which minimizes a cost function of this form. So you have to minimize the cost of the control plus the area over time plus the terminal area. Okay. And here the control effort is some P of E, so E is the total control effort. And then the cost would be a function of this, could be, for example, uh, the square over two of the control effort. Another possibility is to take P of S is zero when S is less than M and plus infinity when S is bigger than M. So is, rather than a cost, this really is a constraint. So you want the total effort to be less or equal than a constant M. And that also is quite interesting. Um, so in this recent paper with my two former postdocs, Maria Teresa Kiri and Najme Salehi, uh, we did some analysis of this type of problems. Uh, in particular, we proved existence of optimal solution under very general uh, setting and some necessary condition for optimality. So here, I want to describe this uh, necessary condition and they are inspired by the classical Pontryagin maximum principle. So uh, what does one do to prove the Pontryagin maximum principle? Uh, of course, you have a standard trajectory, let's say X of T, and uh, what you do, you produce a needle variation, right? So let's say you fix a time T, at time T, you change the value of the control. So at time X of T, instead of being here, the new control gets you here at X epsilon of T, and then you keep the control exactly as before. And then you want to understand whether this change is, uh, is good or bad, that if, it is, if it increases or decreases the total cost. And uh, course that, that involves being able to understand whether this change makes, uh, gives you an advantage. And to do this, um, we need a, du a dual vector. So which uh, economists call them uh, shadow prices. So in this case, P of T would be a vector of prices that you would be willing to pay if, um, by, if the state is changed, let's say from X, to accept them. So um, the, the advantage of choose of moving the set, the, the, the state from X to accept is described by the difference except X epsilon minus X in a product with P of X. So that is a way of accounting the effectiveness of this change. How is this applied to uh, sets, moving sets. Okay, so uh, first thing we want to parameterize our sets and we parameterize the boundary of our set. So for example, at time T, our set would be this big one and then we want to shrink it. So in this picture, the sets are getting smaller and smaller. The final set is this omega T, okay? And we parameterize it uh, in such a way that, okay, for fixed T, X of psi t describes, of course, the boundary of the set. And for fixed psi, as t changes, uh, this describes some curves which are always perpendicular to the boundary of the set. This is the parameterization we use. So it's not an arc length parameterization. It's a perpendicular parameterization. Okay, so this is how you make a small perturbation. So let's say, uh, this is the terminal set, this shaded one. This is the initial one. And let's say at some time tau, I make a perturbation, but a localized perturbation. So in a neighborhood of this point tau psi, so instead of this uh, boundary, I have this perturbed boundary, which is uh, the red one, okay? So let's say I use more control and I reduce a little bit 
the my set in a neighborhood of this point and then from now on all at all pre later times i keep exactly the same effort as before so this would be like a needle variation just at time tau but just at in a neighborhood of this particular uh, characteristic right uh, so uh, the boundaries are parameterized by now x epsilon of t xi after this small change and now i have a dual variable y and in this case the dual variable accounts for the reduction in the total cost that come by reducing the area of my sets at time tau and this of course determines means that also at future time it's a little bit reduced if the effort is just the same okay so i could think of this y of tau psi from the point of view of economists as a price the price that i should pay for a cleaning service right let's say i have a company that allows me uh, offers to clean up a small portion of my contaminated set at time t at the point psi how much does this uh, reduce the total cost right and this reduces the co total cost of by y per unit area that's cleaned up okay um, so this is uh, a statement of the maximum principle uh, actually to avoid being too technical i'll state it in a simpler setting so here i don't put any cost uh, on the control rather i mm, just put a constraint on the control so here i want to minimize the integral well c1 times the measure the area of the contaminated set plus c2 times the measure of the terminal set and subject to and that's the constraint instead of the cost of the control so the total effort at any given time t should be less than this constant m okay and the theorem that in this uh, particular setting and here actually i want to take the effort is the maximum between zero and one plus beta which is just a function like this right so what does it mean uh, it means that if you put no control the contaminated set expands with unit speed in all direction and if you implement a control along the boundary we can clear clean a region of air area m per unit time okay that's what this choice of the effort means and this is useful because uh, if you have this then you can easily compute by how much the area of the contaminated sets uh, how it changes in time right because the derivative of the area is equal to the perimeter minus m because it expands with speed one along the perimeter in all sides in all directions so uh, you have a simple formula for the derivative of the area okay so the necessary condition in this case are as follows um so let's uh, see y of t be an optimal solution so call omega is the curvature the local curvature of the boundary okay and then this adjoint function which is the value of the cleaning service right uh, satisfies this um, uh, ODE along each one of these uh, curves which are perpendicular to the boundary which is quite simple y sub t is equal the curvature times y minus the constant uh, minus c1 okay. Uh, okay so that is the the linearized equation for the dual variable corresponding to the contracting maximum principle and then uh, then there exists a Lagrange multiplier land of t of course this corresponds to the constraint that i have because i have a constraint on the total effort uh, such that the normal velocity beta satisfies this uh, minimum principle so this would be lambda t times the effort minus what i gain by cleaning up 
So that's the reduction in the cost, and that should be the mean. Alberto, yeah. uh, Omega, uh, uh, is John negative or, or is any sign? What? Omega, what? the curvature. Oh, no, Bound it can be positive and negative. And negative. Yeah. Okay. It could be inward pointing yeah. or outward. So, so you, you, you don't need uh, sort of a convexity here. No, no, no convexity here. But you need some regularity because of course. if uh, at least piecewise C2, because otherwise you cannot talk about curvature. For instance, if you take an extreme situation like two balls connected with the tiny. Yeah, that's a problem. In fact, we don't know. In fact, we can solve, uh, as I will say, for any convex set. Uh, but uh, ah, no, you need convexity. Yeah, uh, I'll come to that. Yes. Okay. Uh, no, because otherwise there, there can be separation. Yeah, in fact, uh, this is assuming that you can parameterize it yeah. with, a, I mean, with a single closed curve at any time. Okay, so this is some regularity assumption. So, so this is rather abstract, but um, more concretely, what happens? is that if you have a optimal set motion, then at every time the boundary is the union of arcs where the control is active and arcs where it's not active. So there are parts of the boundary where you are trying to push inward and other parts where you're doing nothing and these other parts of course they are expand, okay? Uh, the active arcs are always circumferences, all with the same radius R of T, and the active arcs must join the other arcs tangentially. So this is another way of stating or deriving from the previous uh, condition. Uh, there is one case where we know what the optimal strategy is. In fact, uh, this was already <laughs> conjectured in my earlier paper with Maria Teresa Kiri and Najme Salehi. Uh, it seems kind of obvious, but then the proof is far more delicate than we expected. So remember that in this setting, the derivative of the area is the length of the perimeter minus the constant m. Okay. So what do you need to do to reduce the area as fast as possible? Well, you have to uh, take away the area at regions where the curvature is maximum, because in this way you can reduce the perimeter as quickly as possible. Okay, so the the result here is that the optimal control is active precisely along the portion of the boundary where the curvature is maximum, and this is a union of circumferences all with the same radius. Right. So, for example, if you start from this uh, ellipse. What you do initially, you clean area here and here. So at the intermediate time, the, the set would be the union of this circumference, uh, this other circumference, and this is some other uh, set of points where you don't uh, clean up, right? And if you start from this uh, a rectangle, you, you do the same, essentially. The, you are trying to put all your effort on the four vertices, near the vertices. So you'll have these four circumferences and the middle part will extend. And maybe I can, uh, yeah. So the, the, in the blue part, do you flatten somehow or? No. Um, you don't do anything. The blue part, uh, Okay, so in, in this blue part, the bound that the initial boundary moves outward with mm -hmm. constant speed. Okay. So, I mean, these are points which are exactly at distance T from the original boundary. Mm -hmm. So for an ellipse, it's slightly curved. Okay. In, that, in this case, it's perfectly okay. straight. Mm -hmm. right, that's what's mm -hmm. happening. Uh, maybe I can show you first. Uh, no. Probably no, because then I I should that uh, <laughs> okay. no, because then uh, okay, this one. Okay, so this is how a if initially yeah, does it yeah. yeah. This one. 
uh, this one, but this, yeah, this one. <laughs> yes. Okay, so for example, if you have a triangle initially, and then you want to clean it up, all the effort would be near the three vertices while the, the sides in the middle will expand. And this is how it happens. See, the middle part keep expanding while uh, after a finite time, it becomes perfectly a circle. And once it's a circle, of course, you try to push it uh, with constant speed at all. Okay, so that's uh, the first graph. Okay, um, maybe now I can go back to, uh, yeah. Uh, is that okay? It's full screen. Okay. Um, so that that would be how the uh, optimal strategy looks like in time, time dependent. Um, okay. Uh, the last topic I want to discuss is. Uh, the case with geographical constraints. So let's say I want to clean up the contamination, but not on the whole plane, but just on an island, right? So my initially, um, so this leads to this constraint null controllability problem. So given M positive, so that's the rate at which I can clean up my set. Um, I want to find a strategy uh, Omega t, omega t, of course, will be some subset of this island, such that initially the entire island is contaminated, and at time t, sometime t positive, it's empty, so it's all clean. And here I want the effort at any given time t should be less or equal than f. Okay, and uh, yeah, uh, what comes? I don't. There's something wrong. Okay, now it works. Okay, so uh, as before, I'm assuming that the effort is the maximum between zero and one plus theta. So that means that uh, the contaminated area grows like the length of this interface now. I mean, not the whole perimeter, but the, the interface inside the island, of course, uh, minus m. Now, first question is, for which values of M can this be solved? Because it may not be solved for every M because, I mean, if this interface is, the length of this is bigger than M, I cannot push it inward because it will expand, right? So for some shapes, I will be able to do it, for some not. And uh, this is related to two geometric invariants of sets. So the first geometric invariant is this uh, minimax. So I'm looking at the, uh, well, this, okay. What is this minimax? Let me explain in plain words. Let's say I want to slice this set in such a way that the longest of these slices is as small as possible, right? For example, here I take, uh, I slice this uh, triangle with these slices and the longest of these slice, of course, in this case would be the vertical one, the height, right? And you can easily convince yourself that you cannot do any better because there must be one slice that goes to C and this has to be at least equal to the, the, the height. So this is the first invariant. The second invariant is a max spin. So in this case, okay, I choose any, um, any subset whose measure is lambda times the measure of the entire set, okay? And among these sets that have this particular area, I want to find the one that has minimum interface. So I minimize the perimeter inside here among all the subsets with length land, with area, lambda times the whole set. And then I take the maximum over, over lambda, okay? 
So in this case, what is this maximum? Well, if lambda is between zero and one half, so here W should be one half of the area of the whole triangle. Okay. So the minimum perimeter would be the area of this arc of circumference. When um, W is bigger than one half, you don't want to have something like this. You don't want to have uh, a, a, something, uh, an arc like this, but what you want to do is a, a, a set like that. So again, in this case, for an equilateral triangle with unit side, the minimax, this one would be 0 0.866, of course, we know from middle school. And uh, this one would be the length of this circumference which bounds uh, an area of equal to half the area of the triangle. Okay. And that is 0 0.643, which is small. Okay. And now what is the result? Well, basically the result is that if M is bigger than the biggest one of these two constants, for sure you can clean it up. And if M is smaller than the smallest of these two, there is no way you can clean it up. And that's what these uh, two things, uh, the two parts of the theorem said. So if the null controllability problem has a solution, then M is must be greater or equal than the smallest of these two constants. And if M is strictly is greater than the biggest one, then for sure you can clean up the set. Okay. Uh, next, what, are, what is the optimal strategy to do this? Uh, so again, uh, uh, the, the problem is always the same. So initially the whole set is contaminated and we want to clean it up in, my, in minimum time. And uh, we can prove some necessary condition for optimality. So at each time T, the interface between the contaminated area and the free one must be the union of arcs where the control is active. So in this case, this would be the right one and arcs where it's not active. So the contamination comes back, okay? And the active arcs are always circumferences, all with the same radius R that depends on T. Okay. Right. And then the active arcs join the other arcs tangentially. So this should be a tangential uh, inter join. And they are meet the boundary perpendicular. So from here to here should be perpendicular. Okay. Um, we have some sufficient condition for optimality. And this is, <laughs> this is very particular type of uh, result because it applies only for a very few, very small class of sets. But I think it's interesting because it uh, gives uh, a connection with the classical DDoS problem. So the con sufficient condition essentially says that, assume that I have an increasing, uh, Sorry, uh, a decreasing family of sets, uh, of contaminated sets. So I keep cleaning up uh, in time and assume that each one of these sets um, minimize the perimeter for given area, okay? Then the strategy is optimal, okay? So in a sense, if I can slice my set with uh, interfaces like this, such that each one of these uh, boundaries is a solution to Dido's problem. Of course, Dido's problem was originally given a rope, enclosed the, uh, the set of largest area for a given uh, length of the rope. Here, given an area, you want to minimize the length of the interface, okay? And uh, so, uh, I regard this as a time-dependent DDoS problem, okay? Uh, and th these are simple, but quite challenging, in fact. Uh, what are the optimal strategies? Uh, so the rules are always the same. So I recall again, uh, the contaminated sets expands with unit speed in all direction and implementing a control, I can clean up an area M per unit time. It's always the same rule. 
what is the best strategy to eradicate the contamination minimum time? So for an equilateral triangle, actually, I, it's clear that I should start cleaning up near one um, vertex. And for short time, the interface should be an arc of circumference. But I cannot go on forever because eventually I should get to here and then at the end of the, strat the optimal strategy would look like that. Okay, so the question is, how do I pass from here to here? Okay, so the there must be some intermediate uh, time where the optimal set, where the, yeah, the set like here, omega of T2 is not, the boundary is not the circumference, an arc of circumference. So what I have to do is, uh, I should in put some interface where the control is not active. And uh, this is at least uh, how we, what we conjecture is the optimal strategy because the only thing that we can come up with that satisfies all the necessary conditions. So at some point we insert this uh, free uh, interface where no control is uh, applied. So for example, at time T2, the control is active on this arc of circumference. And then there is a straight line here where the contamination grows back. And it goes back here. And when this is closer and closer to the, the vertex C, this arc of circumference is smaller and smaller. So we concentrate a lot of control very close to this um, vertex C and then we pass from this one to this one and then to this one, okay? So again, I have another animation that I can show you that's done also by my daughter in Python. And, uh, the other one, which I think is this one. Uh, no, uh, uh, oh yeah, yeah, but this is the end. So there is this. Okay, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Okay, so initially it's all contaminated, all right. So um, so you start by cleaning up one side, but then you have to pass to the other one. See, that is the interesting part, how it goes from one end to the other. So the the in there is one intermediate time where you see the boundary is the union of two pieces. One is the straight where the control is not active. So on that part, it moves to uh, the left and the, the control is active on the arc of circumference. So that would be how it works, at least for this equilateral triangle. Um, okay. so. Uh, go back to the other, and then I can conclude because I see. Um, okay, yeah. So basically, that's the only case we can uh, explicitly solve. And in fact, it turns out that this strategy works when M is. Um, you can explicitly compute for which M this strategy works. And it's 0 0.68, which indeed uh, is something between, this is the smallest of those two geometric invariants. And this is the biggest of the two geometric invariants, which is the, the height. Okay. Um, nearly all the other, uh, nearly, all the other problems we still cannot solve. For example, what happens in the case of a triangle which is not isosceles? So in this case, we expect to have an interface like this, instead of a straight interface, a straight line, it should be something that's tangent to the bisectrix here, but then it curves because it also should be perpendicular to the, uh, side to the basis a b at that point okay and uh, so 
there should be one way to construct this, but that we still don't know how to do it. Uh, so the main thing, if you are able to find this interface at the time where it goes through the point C, everything else is completely determined. Okay. And uh, uh, in my understanding also for general, let's say convex set or smooth set with uh, smooth boundary, um, if the sufficient condition for optimality do not apply, how can we determine an optimal eradication strategy? Okay. Um, very likely there will be regions where the, con the contamination is first eradicated then comes back and then it's uh, cleaned up again. Okay. Uh, how do we determine this? Uh, this is my last slide. So the initial, how it initiates is fairly clear because you have to choose a point where the curvature is maximum and then you can fit a family of uh, circumferences or arcs of circumference which are perpendicular to the boundary at both sides, at both ends. So that's easy. And then you end also in the same way. But then you have to find some maximally expanded interfaces. Uh, if you can find this interface when it's longest, of course, then it, uh, you, you also know the interface at all nearby times because I mean, this curve here is the set of points that has constant distance from this one. So if you find one, you find all the others nearby. So the question is, how do we find this one, which is the maximally extended? Hopefully it should come from a finite number of ODEs, first order or second order ODEs, um, which still we have not figured out. Okay, I think uh, my time is up here. So uh, thank you for the attention. Thank you very much, Alberto, for this uh, very inspiring talk. Uh, it's time for questions. So I know all of you want to make questions. No? Yeah. yeah. A very simple question. Um, in this uh, this problem where you have to decontaminate an island, yeah. let's say. Um, do you have some results, uh, I mean, abstract results that tell that uh, there exists an optimal strategy and your problem is to determine, to understand which is the, yeah. the kind of strategy or or even uh, to know if there is some existence um, properties? Uh, under this type of regularity, let's say, piecewise, uh, smooth boundary, yeah, the existence is pretty much the same as uh, the existence on the whole uh, plane. Mm -hmm. uh, the necessary conditions, well, you can prove in, in similar ways. The, what I think is the real hard problem and most interesting is really like solving it in a generic setting. Generic setting, I would think, for example, a convex set where the curvature has a finite number of local maximum, local minimum, for mm -hmm. example, or triangles starting from triangles, polygons. Or yeah. polygons. Mm -hmm. yeah, even that, mm -hmm. uh, it would be interesting. But we have tried to determine the the ODE corresponding to this one, and it seems it has very bad singularity near this point C. So one thing is writing the ODE, but then we would like, we would expect to find a family of solutions. They, they all come up from C with maybe different uh, second uh, derivative. And some, at least one of these will be, will cross a B perpendicular. Okay. This is the expectation. Um, we have not been able to, uh, to prove this, looking at uh, this equation, because of they are ODE with a bad singularity at the initial, point. which depends on the curvature of the points, or no, no, this, this is just straight. This just is, straight. No uh, the, it's the, just the, yes. okay. so we expect that they have to come up tangent to the bisectric. Okay. So locally, there is certainly one solution, which is the bisectric. 
to that angle. But this is not good because then it touches the lower, uh, the base not perpendicular. So it doesn't match. Okay, so there should be other ones that curve and not be able to find them yet. Okay. Thank you. Other questions? Come on. Younger students, take the courage. Yeah. So now just let me ask you something that could be possibly related with this isosceles triangle, but it's a bit more uh, abstract question, maybe too abstract and too stupid, but uh, essentially you, you have a certain class of uh, initial domain that uh, you can solve the problem. Uh, very few. <laughs> very few. But <laughs> exactly. can you have a certain class of a diffeomorphism that uh, essentially modify a little bit the problem uh, topologically with a certain uh, uh, constraint that uh, preserve the solvability of the problem? Uh, oh, because uh, these interfaces has to be arc of circles. So you have to be very careful with the diffeomorphism. A diffeomorphism does not change an arc of a circle in another arc of a circle. Yeah. So it's, it's very, very rigid in a way. Uh -huh. So it's... Uh, so for instance, uh, if I take a start with uh, a, a, a equilateral triangle and I start to modify just a little bit triangle, into can, isosceles. But if it's not isosceles, uh, this thing here cannot be the bisectrix. And then uh, I don't it's still very frustrating. <laughs> yeah. I mean, uh, no, but it seems that you can start from a sort of a configuration that you know how to solve. Yeah. And then you could introduce, for instance, a one parameter perturbation that uh, modify a little bit. And then uh, uh, one should arrive to a situation that uh, sol solvability breaks down, symmetry uh, breaks down. No, for example, you could put out, is replace this corner with uh, a small arc of a circle. Uh -huh. Well, locally, if when the problem at the time being, the fact is if it's smooth, I can find even too many of these interfaces. And when it has a corner, I can find only one. Mm -hmm. So it seems that you go from one to infinity, uh, two dimensional infinity. So a set, infinite set of interfaces depending on two parameters, which is way too much. <laughs> so an analysis of a symmetry breaking uh, seems uh, uh, a bit far. No? Yeah, because it's very singular when you get close to the boundary at the beginning. So we have been uh, studying this with Elsa Martini <laughs> last week in Milan, but not much progress yet. But uh, we, we have all the equations, actually. But, but they are very rather complicated then you have to sort out which are the leading order coefficient the smallest the lowest one and then you have to balance the lowest ones and then you find what type of equation is obtained by balancing the lowest terms and uh, it seems always too singular <laughs> that's the problem other questions yeah. Sarah <laughs> I'm a person who is not who is not expert. So, <laughs> so if uh, if you impose uh, instead of a pointwise in time uh, bound on the control, like an integral uh, type of control, uh, oh, can you it's, uh, well, can we, you improve? We know existence, uh, but otherwise, it's uh, completely open because uh, it's uh, it's different. Uh, uh, you you will not have exactly this um, circumference. Exactly. So this is so this might help. Problem, very geometric, uh, okay. close to Dido's problem. So I like this because I can think this as a time-dependent Dido's problem, very classical thing. Uh, the others also, it could be interesting to find, uh, to solve something. I'm not sure you can find any explicit solution. But... Hmm. Yeah, you can yeah. prove existence again. Existence again. Condition, but the interesting thing is to describe to generically yes. how what happened. Yes. Yeah. 
Piero, uh, I have one question. Oh, yeah. <laughs> but you have the microphone already. <laughs> You're cheating. <laughs> so uh, you have this t these two geometric invariants, yeah. uh, which are like lower bound and upper yeah. bound. But already in the case of the equilateral triangle, the kind of uh, optimal uh, trajectory that you suggest has a value of M, which is uh, somehow not close to any of the two. So no, there is no done. indication that one of the two should be the correct, uh, so just lower and upper bound, but not. Yes, okay. none of them is sharp. Right? Okay. It's something. Not even in this simple example, so in the, like the triangle. Uh, so. Yeah, I expect hmm. those will always be a strict upper, strictly bigger and strictly smaller than the minimum of the actual. Yeah. Other questions? That, that also was a question from a grandson. <laughs> okay, so if no other question are on the table, we thanks again Alberto for this uh, very nice talk. And uh, is there something that uh, I have to announce? No. Okay. So thanks for participating, people uh, here and people online. So see you next, Palatin. Okay.